We've just finished looking at exam one solution. Um, as far as announcements go, uh, you need to bring your computer to class for the next several weeks. And homework-wise, you get a little bit of a break. Your next assignment isn't due until Thursday the 4th. I guess that's next week, so it's not a huge break. But um, I am going to give you some information related to the course project today. We're going to go over that. And then we will uh, dive into the new material, which is rate of return analysis. So any questions on the announcements? All right. The course project, 9% uh, of your grade. And I give out a lot of full credits on the course project. It's the sort of thing where um, you can come to me and ask if you've done the project right. And I'll tell you, yes, you've done it right. This is full credit. Or no, you haven't got it right. Uh, you need to keep working. So there's no reason why everyone in this class can't get 100% on, on the project. Um, it's due Tuesday, November 6th. So you've got more than a month to work on it. And it's the sort of thing where like, uh, a student who just dives right in, is really focused, puts the phone into airplane mode, doesn't get distracted, and just works could probably complete the project in a couple of hours. Um, it doesn't come that naturally to everyone, but for the people who work quickly, a couple of hours. If you don't work qu as quickly, I can't see this taking any more than maybe seven or eight hours at most. And that's if you really sink your teeth into it. So uh, the, the value per time spent is pretty favorable for this, especially since so many people can get 100% on it. So let's talk about the project. OK, this looks, oh man, that's dark. <laughs> Nobody fall asleep, all right? Hopefully you had your coffee today. Uh, this looks like a really nice area. But what we're interested in as engineers is this. We've got some sort of a structure at the water line. And this is probably the ocean. So we've got a structure at the water line, and then some sort of a reservoir or a pond or a pool up top. I don't see any houses around. So this isn't some millionaire's swimming pool. Anyone want to guess what we're looking at? OK, that would be a reasonable guess, a slurry pond. Doesn't look like a slurry pond, though. That looks like pretty nice water. I mean, like when they have those coal ash ponds that they've been talking about got you know, spilled by the hurricane. It's usually pretty mucky stuff. So that's a reasonable guess. Actually, I could ask you to guess all day, and maybe it wouldn't come to you. What it is is this is a situation where, at certain parts of the day, they're pumping water from the ocean to fill this reservoir. And then at other parts of the day, they allow the water to go down back into the ocean. Does that sound like a waste of money or what? Pumping water up? and then let it flow down. Every day, the same thing. Lift the water up, let it flow down. So they wouldn't do this if there was just no, no point. You know, there definitely has to be a point to it. Uh, it happens in lots of different places. It's not just this one spot where they're pumping water up uh, at night and letting the water flow down at day. And that is the typical cycle of it is that at night is when they're doing the pump upward. And then during the day is when they have the water flow out of the reservoir and back into the ocean. And that daily cycle is related, actually, to how we use electricity as a society. So there's lots of different spots where they're doing this thing called pump storage. The uh, pump storage, in a lot of cases, looks a little bit like a dam. This is a pump storage that looks like a dam. And um, one of the objectives when dams are in place is to try and get electric power out of them. You know, Hydroelectric power with a dam is that you've got this water up real high. And then you're going to use the water that's up high to go down uh, through a turbine and generate electricity. Now, what? What do these pictures bring to mind, the one in the lower left? OK, power plant. But that shape, that shape, what does that make you think of? It makes me think of nuclear power, specifically. They have cooling towers at other types. 
But there's just something about that shape that, yeah, I guess it's maybe watching The Simpsons for all those years. It makes me think of a cooling tower and nuclear power together. The thing about a nuclear reaction is it doesn't stop on a dime. You know, like once it gets going, once that uh, heat builds up, it takes a long time for them to slow down the nuclear reaction and for the water to cool. That's one of the big problems that they had at Fukushima um, in Japan when there was the tsunami, uh, the earthquake followed by the tsunami, is that they had this hot core and it was still hot even when they turned off their cooling pumps and so it started to melt down. So uh, how this ties into pump storage is that at night we don't use as much electricity as we do during the day. I mean, think about the, the ways that you use electricity. During the day, maybe you're running your washing machine. Uh, during the day, maybe you are charging up, uh, you probably charge your phone at night, too. The main thing that people use electricity for during the day, like that accounts for the really peak surge in demand, is cooling. It's the air conditioner um, because it's hotter during the day. And so if you look at electricity consumption over time, there's a huge demand at the day, and then there's all this excess electricity at night. And so what pump storage does is it uses the electricity at night that otherwise has nowhere to go, and you use that leftover electricity that's priced very cheaply, by the way. Um, nuclear power plants are willing to sell electricity at night for you know, just a penny a kilowatt hour, maybe, whereas during the peak hours, they may charge 10, 11, maybe even 15 cents a kilowatt hour. At night, electricity is cheap. And so someone had the idea, oh, I'm going to do arbitrage. That's where you're looking at the value of something is low over here, and the value of it over here is high, so I'm going to move where it is and, get, and capture that value for myself. So somebody said, there's all this cheap electricity. How do I sell it at a different time of day? And what they figured out is if, if I use that cheap electricity to lift water, then I use that water to go down through a generator during the day when there's a lot more demand for electricity and where people are willing to pay more for it, I can keep the profit. Now, it's not all profit because you have to pay to construct this. And that's expensive. You know, building a reservoir is not cheap. You have to line the reservoir, a lot of earthwork and excavation. There are engineering costs. There's the cost of the pipes. There's the cost of the generator that's going to be used to produce the electricity. There's the cost of the pumps that are lifting the water up. And don't forget, there is a little bit of cost associated with the electricity that you're buying during the nighttime hours. And so this is a really interesting intersection of engineering and finance, because what the engineers and the finance people have to do is figure out like what's the optimal operating point. And you want to maximize your profits. You want to put as much money in your pocket as possible. And so what you have to do is you have to figure out uh, how big should that reservoir be? Should it be a relatively small reservoir like this? Well, it depends on how many people are on the island. It maybe depends on how much demand there is. It depends on the difference between the daytime price and the nighttime price. It depends on how much you're paying for pipe. It depends on the cost of the power plant, on the cost of the pump, and so on. So what you're going to do in this project is you've got some hypothetical pump storage opportunity. And, we have, and that means that there's an elevated reservoir, and the water flows through a pipe. At night, it flows uphill. During the day, it flows downhill. And in the assignment I'm going to give you, I tell you how many hours there are during the daytime how many hours there are at night. Because the water flows uphill during a certain period, it flows downhill over a different number of hours each day. So it's not 12 and 12, it's 10 and 14. Uh, so there's a pipe here and a pump that's used to lift the water. The power plant is in the same building. It's just essentially the pump in reverse where you're generating electricity. And there's a formula. Now, none of you have taken fluid mechanics yet. I'm teaching fluid mechanics this semester. Uh, maybe are some of you in fluid mechanics? OK. A handful of you are in fluid mechanics. And so uh, maybe some of these equations will, will seem familiar to you, but you don't have to be in fluid mechanics to do this project. I've given this project to lots of students who never took fluid mechanics. And I give you the equations you need, so you'll be able to handle it. I already know that. 
One of the formulas that you'll need to use in this project is to figure out what's the speed or the velocity of the water in the pipe. And so that's the flow rate Q, cubic meters per second, divided by A, meaning the cross-sectional area of the pipe. So if you know the pipe's diameter, then you can calculate the area, pi d squared divided by 4. That's the formula. Now, how much power comes out of this in terms of watts? You sell power by kilowatt hours. And so a certain watt level over a certain duration of time, that's how you decide how much power has been sold. And so you generate power according to this formula. And by the way, you don't need to be furiously writing all this down. It's in the handout. In fact, let me give you the handout right now, just so you've got it in front of you as we go over this. It's not a bad idea to be taking notes, but I do give you some of these formulas on your uh, handout paper. Who thinks this sounds interesting? Everybody should be raising their hand. This is definitely interesting. This is the best project you'll ever do. Unless you take uh, hydraulic engineering, then there's a better project. But this is a pretty good one. <laughs> OK. Did everybody get a copy of the handout? All right. So, so there's a formula that tells you, for a certain flow rate, how much power you get. There's a formula that tells you how much head is available. That's just one of the parameters that goes into this power formula, H. And it's based on the velocity. And remember, velocity is based on flow rate. All of these things, the point is, a lot of your costs and a lot of your revenues are based on what the flow rate, what the flow rate of water through the pipe is. So in the project, you're going to be telling me like what's the right size of pipe and what flow rate should go through the pipe in order to generate the most amount of money. And uh, a lot of that just ties into the flow rate. So there are these powers that tell you uh, at night when you're using power to lift the water, how much power you're using. Because that's going to be one of your costs, is the power. Uh, there's how much head is required when you're pumping because H is one of the factors that goes into the power equation. Um, and I've simplified the project a little bit compared to previous semesters. If you turn to the second page, you'll see that I tell you there are two pipe diameters available. In the past, I made students analyze five different pipe diameters. So you're getting a slightly easier version of the project. But here's the deal is you're buying the electricity for one penny per kilowatt hour, KWH. So that means 1,000 watts during a one hour period. So if I plug in something to the wall, and it's using 1,000 watts, and it runs for one hour, then I've just consumed one kilowatt hour. And so uh, if I consumed it at night, I'd pay a penny for that kilowatt hour. If I consumed it during the day, I'd pay 12 cents a kilowatt hour. So this is the financial assumption that you're going to be making. It's the spread between what you're buying and what you're selling. And that's a pretty good markup. You know, 1 to 12, that's a nice markup. Of course, there are going to be other costs there. By the way, uh, Elon Musk is doing something similar to this down in Australia with uh, big lithium ion batteries. Instead of doing pump storage, they're trying to use batteries so that you know, during the daylight hours when there's wind and when there's photovoltaic, they can capture the electricity and then they'll sell it at night when there's a bigger market for electricity because those sources don't really work when there's no sun or when there's less wind. So pump storage isn't the only way to capture electricity. But until very recently, it was kind of the only cost-effective way of doing it. Um, so I'm going to ask you to figure out when the diameter is one meter, what flow rate will produce break-even. And by break-even, that means the, uh, the revenue is equal to the costs. And there are two break-even points. 
There's the first break-even point, which is a low flow rate, and the second break-even point, which is a high flow rate. Um, and then part B is looking at, for a certain flow rate, then um, what is the, uh, the present value for all the pipe diameters. All right, um, let me point out one other thing on the handout that I've given you, and that is this getting started page, the last one. See the one that says getting started? This probably, like, so far you may be thinking, I just don't even know where to begin on a project like this. It may seem overwhelming. And to help it seem a little bit more natural and help you figure out how these equations work, what you need to do is go through these questions, A through R, on the handout, and solve them on paper. And I insist that you solve it on paper. You can't solve it on the uh, spreadsheet, not yet. This first part you have to do on paper. And um, at the end, you'll see that I have an answer for J and an answer for R. If you do all your calculations right, you should get these same exact answers. And the, the point of this is for you to be able to set up the equations on paper and kind of figure out how they work. And then later on, you're going to be able to translate that to the computer. Because I'm asking you to try a lot of different flow rates and rather than do that over and over and over by hand, it will be so much easier just to have it in the spreadsheet. But first, I want you to, to know that you can do these calculations right, because if you have these answers on paper that you're confident in, that I'll, I'm happy to verify that you've done it correctly, then you can take those same values into the spreadsheet you design and check to make sure that you have everything, all the equations set up uh, correctly in the spreadsheet. So. If you want to get started on the project, the first place to begin are these calculations on the getting started page. And then once you've done that, you can begin to translate those same formulas into Excel. OK, so that's all I'm going to say for now on the project. If there are some questions that come up, we'll definitely have time to continue to discuss it over the coming uh, weeks. All right, so on the project, on the screen now is uh, a food truck, uh, Disco Dogs. I actually looked up this food truck, and I looked up some information because I think it's, a, uh, it's an example that people can kind of relate to. I went to uh, Portland a couple of years ago, and they have several city blocks that have nothing but food trucks. Like here in Huntington, there's the coffee one that parks over in Hal Greer. And sometimes there's like a, a hamburger food truck over by the student center, like Steak and Shake. But we don't have as many as Portland. Portland, there's hundreds, and they're awesome. They've got every kind of food you can think of. So I really like food trucks a lot. Um, but they're tough business, because the truck itself costs about $85,000. And it's, it's not just the vehicle. What you're paying for with that $85,000 is like the, uh, the stove and the fire uh, suppression system and uh, you know it, there, there's a lot of kitchen implements inside there that drives up the cost um, so I looked up the menu of this disco dogs and they charge 850 for a hot dog and people will pay it you know that's hard to believe right like I thought hillbilly hot dogs was kind of overpriced but 850 takes it to a whole new level for the lucky Chucky um, so the question is Let's say that you wanted to go into business. You feel like an entrepreneur. You know, you've got, on the one hand, people who are insane and are willing to pay $8.50 for a hot dog. And on the other hand, you've got this big expense, $85,000 to get started if you want to buy a food truck. Uh, the question, one of the first ways to analyze a business opportunity like this is how long does it take until you've broken even? You know, how long until you've covered the costs? So that's what our in-class example today is going to go through, is a step-by-step -step analysis of the break-even time to just kind of illustrate that before break-even, you haven't covered the cost of your loan and you're, quote, in the hole, end quote, you know, that, that you're in debt. After break-even, you've received enough revenue that you've retired that initial investment, and now any additional funds are kind of going towards the profits. 
So to do that analysis, what we're going to calculate is something that we'll call unrecovered investment balance. This semester, I've tried to warn you anytime there's something that I've seen a lot of students struggle with, you know, like where there's common mistakes, because I want you to avoid those common mistakes. Uh, this phrase, unrecovered investment balance, is something that students consistently struggle with. And so I don't want you to just jump over it and assume that, oh, this is just another vocabulary word that I don't really need to know. This is a really critical and important phrase, and if you don't absolutely understand what it is at the end of today's class, then you need to go back through the text, and you should anyway, but especially if you don't understand it at the end of today's class, you need to uh, dig into the textbook and really uh, understand what unrecovered investment balance means. Just as the broad strokes, what it means is when you first invest $85,000, you can think of your ledger as being negative 85000 but then what happens is that actually that negative 85,000 gets bigger because interest is accumulating. And so hopefully you'll make some revenue, but temporarily the unrecovered investment balance increases each year due to uh, the accumulation of interest. So here's a graphical representation of what I was just saying, that we begin with we spent $85,000. Now, that 85000 is that an inflow or an outflow? It's an outflow. Right, that means the money's going out. And in the past, when we've done cash flow diagrams, we'd represent that with an arrow downward. This isn't a cash flow diagram. This is a diagram of something else. So don't be thrown off by the fact that the line is above the horizontal axis. It's above the horizontal axis because that vertical axis is called unrecovered investment balance. So it's already, by virtue of the label that's on that axis, it's assuming it means debt. How much debt do you have? So in, we, in our mind, we know that we're all, this is talking about negative numbers. We know that in our mind. And we know that if we'd drawn a cash flow diagram, it would look like this. We'd have a single outlay at year zero, and then we'd have lots of revenues over time. This is the cash flow diagram. This is a diagram of unrecovered investment balance. So it means you made an investment, but your business hasn't paid you back yet. So what happens is that that initial outlay is maybe 85,000, and then during the first year, the amount of the unrecovered investment balance is going up because of interest. And so at the end of the first year, you have an even bigger unrecovered investment balance. But then you get your revenues for the year. And in one big lump sum, that brings the unrecovered investment balance down a bit. But then interest accumulates again. You get your revenue. It brings it down. So there's this cycle of each year. You're operating the business, earning revenue, and it's paying down the unrecovered investment balance. So a couple of labels here that you need to know what they mean. R is revenue. So where it's saying R minus E, you know, this arrow, the size of that arrow is that however much revenue you had during the first year minus your expenses for the first year. So in the case of the food truck, it would be the number of hot dogs you sold, multiplied by the sales price, and that would give you the revenue. But then the expenses you'd have to subtract out would be like propane, salaries, insurance, fuel for the, fuel, uh, for the food truck, and so on. So you'd have to get the difference between the two because those are the profits. Revenue minus expense is profit. And it's the profit that will bring down your unrecovered investment balance. It's not just the revenues. It's the profit that drives down the unrecovered investment balance. Any questions about this figure? Now, I'm going to throw out a new really important uh, term, and that is the internal rate of return. The internal rate of return is some interest rate, I prime, and the prime there is just to emphasize that it's unknown. So in an analysis like this, 
oftentimes what you're trying to do is you're trying to find out if, uh, if you want to achieve break even by a certain time, you know, like 10 years, the internal rate of return would be the, uh, the value of interest rate that causes the break even by a certain number of years. So the balance would be zero, meaning that there's balance between your profits and the initial outlay at year n. We're going to talk more about internal rate of return, but the first thing that you need to, in your mind, think of is that it's an interest rate that makes there a balance between the inflow and the outflow at a certain number of years n. All right. This is important stuff. Um, I prime will be an interest rate that we're going to solve for in a lot of future um, class periods and in-class exercises. The whole point of this class is decision making. The whole point of this class is to give you the tools you need to do an analysis of the, the types of questions that you'll be able to answer is, should we do this project, yes or no? Um, the types of questions you'll be, the answer, be able to answer is, you know, we have option A, B, and C. Which of those three alternatives is best? And so you'll be able to do analyses like this. Solving for the internal rate of return is one of the things you need to be able to do to make decisions. So that's why I'm telling you about it, is that uh, solving for the internal rate of return is one of the analysis procedures that can tell you whether or not a project is a yes or a no. All right, so let me hand out this in-class exercise. Um, let's say that you're going to go for it. You decide you're going to open up that food truck that you've always been dreaming of, and you found a bank loan that is 4% per year. They want to be repaid in five years. So what I'd like you to do is draw a cash flow diagram for this scenario. How much would you have to pay back each year if it's going to be paid off in five years? That's step A. A is draw the cash flow diagram. B, you notice on the back side of the paper is the 4% table. So find out how much the loan repayment needs to be to pay it back in five years. And then in uh, part C is where you're going to use the computer. That's why I asked you to bring your computer today. So that you can set up Excel similar to the template that I've given you. And you'll notice that there are column numbers. And then below the table is the formulas that you'll need to solve the value in each column. So I'm not going to give away too much. I mean, I think between the title of the column and the formulas that I've provided, you should probably be able to get a pretty good head start on what this is. Now, of course, I'm going to go over it. I'll put it up on the screen. But uh, once you solve the amounts in the table, then that will allow you to fill in the blanks in the schematic diagram on the back. All right. So you are uh, welcome to work with your classmates on this and you know, talk through it together. If you didn't happen to bring a computer with you today, then you'll maybe need to look over the shoulder of your classmate as they, as they do it.
So if you're getting 85000 in year zero for the bank, you're going to have to repay them a certain amount each year for five years. What this analysis is illustrating is of that repayment that you're doing, uh, how does it end up that you have zero balance at the end of it? Like what's the split between principal and interest? Um, so the first part is figuring out the amount of the payment. So $19,093.55 is how much you have to pay each of those five times. So let, let me demonstrate from the beginning uh, what this analysis is showing. So first of all, we have $85,000 that is our unrecovered investment balance at the beginning. So the interest during a one-year period is going to be 4% of the 85,000. So during the one year from when you first receive the money till the first payment is due, what that means is that the interest is 4% of the beginning unrecovered investment balance at the, at the start of the year. So that means at the end of the year, there's the original amount you borrowed and the interest that is accumulated. So that's how much you owe at the end of the year, right before you make your first payment and then you make the payment of $19,093.55 that we got from the paper calculations. This is only showing 19094 but I actually typed in the 55. I just had it round off to the nearest dollar. So all the precision's back there in its mind. The computer doesn't have a mind. In the memory. Now how much of that goes towards principal? Well, what we have to do to figure out the principal amount is we need to find the difference between what was the payment and how much interest accumulated during that year. So that means that 15000 goes towards uh, the principal because anytime you make a payment, some of it is for principal, some of it is for interest. And so then the unrecovered investment balance is the previous unrecovered investment balance at the beginning of the year minus how much principal went towards covering that. So that means at the end of the year, the bank has yet to recover $69,306. You know, the $3,400 was just the amount that they got during the one-year period, but they're still, remember, they want to recover the principal and interest. And so this shows you how you can uh, find the balance of how much of the overall payment goes to the interest and how much of it goes to principal. Okay, now what it says is that for, for next years after the first year, then the unrecovered principal balance at the beginning of the year is the same thing as the unrecovered principal balance at the end of the previous year. So the end of year one is the same as the beginning of year two. Now, this is really nice. What we can do is we can just drag everything else down like this. And since we anchored the reference up to the interest rate, everything is just going to automatically calculate for the next row that we're on, all the way through to the end of the analysis. Oh, except for one thing here. It started, it, it thought it saw a pattern there, so I need to make sure it's always the same amount. So let me change that slightly so that it's the same amount every year. And what it shows is that by the end, we get to an unrecovered principal balance that's effectively zero. It's not exactly zero because, remember, I found this payment amount by using the factor tables. And the factor tables aren't exactly precise. So it gets me pretty close to zero, but not all the way. But what it basically shows is that the loan has been repaid at the end of the five years. You know, that's what the cash flow diagram said, was that we have some inflow at year zero, we make payments, and then uh, it all balances out. This shows in detail how it balances out. So then there's that figure. And these are the blanks that you should fill in. It comes from the table. So the concept here is that the amounts, um, sorry that scanned in so weird. The amounts start at the 85,000 
unrecovered investment balance and it, it goes up a little bit because of interest during the year. And so it peaks out at 88,400. But then when we make the payment of 19,000 some odd dollars, that brings the unrecovered investment balance down. And this is all from the perspective of the bank because their investment was giving you a loan. And so this is the bank's perspective. When you make a payment to them, their unrecovered investment balance goes down because they've recovered something. Every time you make a payment, they're recovering some of their original investment. And in the end, the unrecovered amount goes down to effectively zero. I would suggest that you uh, save this file. Be sure that you save your in-class exercise so you can come back to it later. There will be a point where you'll need to calculate an unrecovered investment balance. Question? Yeah, so why did we start with year one? Um, because the beginning of year one is zero. And so the reason why we don't have it is that in different columns, I'm saying the beginning, the beginning of the year and the end of the year. And so that's a good question. I'm gl glad you asked that. Let's draw the cash flow diagram again. From the perspective of the bank, it would be that they gave money, and then there was these series of inflows. All right. And the way that we label time here is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And so what this is, is this is the first year. And then this is the second year. And so the first year starts at 0 and ends at 1. And so here in this diagram, what we're saying is uh, year 1 is that time period. The beginning of that time period is 0 on the cash flow diagram. But nothing happened during, like, there isn't a year zero. There's just the first year of the loan. The beginning of the first year is time zero. But I guess uh, the main way I'd describe it is that each one of these rows represents a, a period of time rather than a moment in time. Are there other questions about this one? OK, um, I can definitely stick around for a few minutes if you want to get your spreadsheet all the rest of the way there. But if you've already got it, you're free to go. My suggestion is get an early start on this, uh, on this project. You know, why not aim for doing the getting started page? Like if you have that solved by next Tuesday, that'd be a really nice head start. So don't delay, don't procrastinate.